the 8th Air Force had been crying out for a plane with the Mustang's capability. And though the first Bs were assigned to tactical groups with the 9th Air Force, the Strategic Command first borrowed them and then swapped them for some of their P-47s to use them as long-range offensive fighters supporting the bombing. had found their element, and with wing tanks providing extra fuel, they roamed the sky over Europe, increasingly not simply supporting the bombers, but seeking combat with the Luftwaffe. As escorts, they were the first effective shield the strategic campaign had enjoyed, and with their guardianship, the danger to the bombers of Luftwaffe attack started to wane. As their numbers increased, there was now no doubt about their role in the European theatre. There was simply no better escort fighter anywhere at the time, and their greater availability was paralleled by an increasing dominance of the air over Europe by the Allied air forces. The Luftwaffe's pilots were used to enjoying at least parity with the opposing fighters, if not overwhelming advantages. Against the Mustang, they were not matched, but bettered. From bases throughout Europe, the Mustangs held increasing sway over the air war. One of the units flying the Mustang was the all-Negro 322nd Fighter Group, which operated from Italy and was involved in several of the war's most famous missions, including the attacks on the Romanian oil fields around Plersti. Working in fairly basic conditions from temporary fields, groups like these put in their contribution with dedication and effectiveness. For the pilots, being briefed for a mission, there must have been some comfort in the superior performance of their plane. And the feelings of the bomber crews, who had previously flown into the teeth of the German defences unaccompanied, can well be imagined. Still, on any mission, there was a real chance for each pilot that he would be killed or maimed in the coming hours. Mustangs on the campaign in Germany is reflected in the comment of Goering at Nuremberg that when he looked into the skies over Berlin and saw Allied fighters shepherding the bombers to their deadly work, he knew that Germany had lost the war. The planes he was referring to were Mustangs. The effect of the uprated fighter was to be felt on most of the fronts of the war, as here in China, where they replaced the P-40 and gave Allied air power a cutting edge. Once again, operating from primitive bases, this time at the end of a supply line of almost bizarre complexity, the Mustang's range and power were used to quickly establish air superiority against the outmoded and outclassed enemy equipment.
battle on any front made a difference. In a relative backwater like the China campaign, even a few Mustangs made an immediate impression. They operated beside the tired P-40s of the nationalist Chinese, the planes that had equipped the famous American volunteer squadron, the Flying Tigers. The surviving American pilots, most of them aces, had moved on to sprinkle that very rare and very valuable commodity, experience, through the United States Air Forces, leaving behind the long slogging campaign against the Japanese in China that was to drag on to the war's end. The 356th Fighter Squadron, flying from England, became the home of Major James Howard, one of the Flying Tiger Aces, whose Japanese victories were painted onto his distinctively marked plane upon arrival in Europe. He became famous for his exploits on the 11th of January 1944, when he took on 40 German planes, mostly Messerschmitt 110s, that had managed to mount an attack on a group of B-17s. This, his gun camera footage from that dogfight, shows his targets as he continued to attack the overwhelmingly superior number of enemies until assistance arrived. He was involved in the little battle for 30 minutes and was credited with three definite and three probable victories in the encounter. Major Howard was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor for his action on that day. Among the few criticisms the RAF had made of the Mustang was a dual complaint about the canopy. It didn't allow the pilot to look behind him, and a tall pilot was very uncomfortably cramped against the roof of the cockpit. Robert Malcolm was requested to come up with a remedy for these problems and the resulting modification was not only included in production B and C models, but retrofitted to many planes in the field. A single piece bulged hood that slid on runners, it simply and directly approached the concerns as an adaptation of the already existing shape. 